there is a lot of uh, work ongoing in ET Bioenergy in the platform to um, support the market introduction and the research and innovation on bioenergy and biofuels. And there is also a supporting project uh, that um, supports uh, the activities of the platform. Um, within these activities, we um, have, for example, produced a few review articles on the topics of biogas, hydrogen and fischer tropsch And the fischer tropsch one will be presented in this session today. And uh, you can find um, all these uh, review articles on the website and the position papers and reports. And on the website, you also find a lot of um, other information. For example, general information on feedstocks and technologies you can find under value chains. But if you want more condensed information, you can go to the fact sheets and guidelines sec section. Uh, if you want to see uh, the demonstration facilities, you can go to the uh, database section and look at the production facilities database. Uh, so please um, don't hesitate and look up. We really have a lot of information online available for everyone. And if you're interested to do more and to actively contribute to ET Bioenergy, uh, please just send an email to the secretariat and um, the teams and colleagues will surely be happy to be in touch with you about details of joining any of the working groups, for example. So, um, with this, I think um, we could start into the session. Um, I see Stephen Silva and Sene online, but I don't see Monica Normark yet. So, maybe um, we will skip that first presentation, Tease, is that okay? And we directly go to the presentation of Stephen Gust. Yes, Monica informed me that she has some connection problems, but I'll try to try to solve the issue with her so we can stop this. So we start with Stephen's presentation then. Okay. So then I will be happy to introduce to you Stephen Gust, um, who is a consultant on advanced biofuels and sustainability and who has been working for a long time with Neste, where he was um, involved in all research and demonstration activities. And um, he will talk today about hydrothermal uh, liquefaction and how to upgrade that. Uh, so, Stephen, um, the floor is yours. Oh, um, thank you very much. And um, see, 76 online now, so that's very nice. And uh, I'm getting teased to do the presentation. I mean, to move forward with the presentation because I haven't used this platform. So, there could be a little bit of um, slowness in moving forward. But yeah. Um, Tease, if you go to the next slide, please. So, the reason why I have this slide is that um, this is sort of a bit of background for my own work too. As Dina said, I was involved in different pilots and demonstration facilities over the years. I have a uh, 35 years at Nest and is just retired in September. So I was I was working on a thermal fast pyrolysis. We had a pilot plant. And we had a demonstration plant with uh, gasification, and um, I was in charge of the Fisher tropes. And so, um, after that, we also did some upgrading work on catalytic pyrolysis, and we had some upgrading work on HTL. So my my background is in sort of advanced bi biofuels and pilots and demonstrations. And the reason for this slide is that um, we, at least at when when during the time I was at Neste, we were focusing on is drop in drop in biofuels and so we wanted to produce hydrocarbons i'm sure the audience knows that neste does this renewable diesel and we um hydro treat vegetable oils and animal fats and produce drop in drop in biofuels and um from the advanced biofuel side too of course you you, you couldn't make oxygenates but my, my focus has always been on these um advanced biofuels drop in biofuels and then they will require hydrogen for fast pyrolysis you could you could also crack or there's some other other techniques possible to um produce these um hydrocarbons but if these goes to the next slide then and um, i just wanted to point out to people that you know we, we're talking about htl as if it's fairly new and it is it has come back and but over, over the years there's been lots of work and i brought i brought up this this patent by this um ernst burrow 
and um, he he showed that you could you could convert biomasses into these biocrudes and you could upgrade them. And at that time, they were looking at the additives to the processes, these carbonates, for some in situ hydrogen production, and then they had pH pH um, adjustment too. So, I mean, this this has been been around for a while. S since then, there's been lots of different projects, but the, the, the fundamentals of converting biomass into a biocrude and upgrading it into hydrocarbons has been around. So this is this is really not, nothing new, and uh, and uh, it has been shown to work. But now now we are sort of re let's say re reintroducing these um this 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 process and the upgrading. So maybe go to the next slide then. And this this is just. I, I haven't been involved in the, the development of HTL or upgrading, but these are the things I, I look at when, when I do, you know, the, the um, sort of the, the commercialization pathway understanding of that, what, what has to be done. So as everybody knows, we have subcritical and supercritical processes. There is processes where you um, recycle some of the aqueous phase oxygenates, and there's different ways to make these slurries. And then after the eight, after the bio crude is made, then you know you you get the solids out, you get the ash out, you can you can put it into various fractions. And then what I'm going to say a few words today about this this upgrading, what what has been done, and maybe a little bit about the status and what has left to be done. But when we when we look at upgrading, these these are all the the sort of the areas we look at. What what can we do it in one reactor? Do we need multiple reactors? Water temperatures and hydrogen pressures, and we we have the possibility to use fixed bed reactors, or there's other types of reactors also where the catalyst is in a slurry slurry form. How much catalyst we need, and uh, what what is the catalyst lifetime? And dur during my time at Nest, I've spent a lot of time looking at hydrogen consumption and the effect of hydrogen consumption on the greenhouse gas balance. As, as we know. We want to produce biofuels, and so we don't want to use a lot of fossil hydrogen to upgrade these because this will reduce the the, the benefit of the bio, biofuel. And um, for the um, bio oils, depends on the feedstock, depends on the process. There's different amounts of hydrogen that is going to be re needed to um, produce these um, drop-in hydrocarbons, and so that's that's very important. That's one thing I focus on all the time: how much hydrogen we need, and then. Um, is it going to be green hydrogen? We, 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 at least very recently now, there's been so much talk about green hydrogen and blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen. So um, this has to be taken into account. And then, of course, in the end, we, we need these volumes and we have to do testing. Um, just just from, from my past experience, even though, even though the, the hydrocarbons could be very similar to um, existing hydrocarbons, you still have to do quite a lot of engine testing to get the OEMs to sign off that they would give a warranty in their engine. So this this is all very important to to produce large volumes and to do these engine tests. Now, if T's could go to the next slide, um, this is this is just now some some examples. This is from this high flex fuel. EU project and it has recently finished and so they have presented some of their. Their findings, and this is this is the, the work by Halder Tops, and stating that you know this um, upgrading of the bio crude will will be, will be required to be done in stages. So um, there is this HDM, which is the hydro demetallization, and then you you look at upgrading and cracking and bringing hydrogen in. And so this is not to state I'm not trying to state that this this, this is the way it should should be done. But this is one of the ways to to do the upgrading, and um, so all the tops has some experience in this, and this this is what the the sort of um, the uh, types of process they, they use for this high flex field, but there are other processes also. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to um, just remind people that you know when we when we have these catalytic processes, we want the catalyst to last a long time. So we we don't want to sort of so-called kill, kill the catalyst. And it depends on what type of metals you have in these biocrudes, they will affect the, the lifetime of the catalyst. And uh, this is the, so a PhD thesis by Klaus Jensen 
and he he was experimenting with different techniques to remove the metals and he was able to get the metals down to under 50 ppm but normally normally for the catalytic processes we we like to see the metals at a at a let, let's say significantly under 10 ppm when i was um working with the fisher tropes process there there was some some contaminants that we had to get under 10 ppb so you cannot state definitely what is going to be the final concentration of the metals that the catalyst would have a sufficient lifetime. It's um, testing at the catalysts and you, you have experiences fr from other types of feeds, other processes, what, what, you, what you would like to get. So the, the bio, biomass sewage sludges, they have a, lot of, have a lot of metals in them and they come through the process and you have to you have to um, develop techniques to get the metals down to very low levels because you want to have as long catalyst lifetime as possible. In the in the other other let's say point that he made in this um, upgrading work that Klaus was working on is that you know this um, this bio, bio still contains some oxygen and you have some exotherms and you don't want to have exotherms that um cause polymerization or cause or cause the um the uh, bio crude to react with itself and so you you're, you're going to have to look quite carefully at at the, the temperature rise in, in the first reactor and um ma make sure you don't start to coke, coke the catalyst they say and pr produce some very long chain hard, hard to remove compounds so just wanted to point out that there is some very important aspects in this upgrading that we have to look at. We go to the next slide then. The next slide I put here because I, I wanted to show you that, you know, this um, different, different feedstocks have different hydrogen to carbon ratios in them to begin with. And then when you up, upgrade or add hydrogen, then you can uh, get it to, let's say, reasonable levels. Um, I've focused most of my time in my work on these different lignocellulosics. And so this is what I'm most familiar with. And this here is wheat straw, but there is also wood, wood residues. And um, this, this shows that it's from, from, this, from the work they've done on the wheat straw, they got the uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio up to this 1.6, 1.7, which is coming to something reasonable. But if, if we go please to the next slide, you, you will see that in this in this next slide, then when you have lignocellulosics, if you look at the very bottom, this this is what I really pay attention to the residue. So we, we went we went, let's say traffic grade or um, jet jet fuel grade hydrocarbons coming out, and so some some feedstocks after they've come through some HTL processes and are upgraded, they still have this um, fairly high residue amounts and. It's it's going to be important to get this re residue amount down to as low as possible. This this could possibly be used in the in the marine marine fuel sector, and this could replace marine fuels, which is uh, sort of cur currently something they they would like to increase the renewable content. So I, I'm not saying that this this has no no value, but it it could have less value, and we have to then look at how much residues are left from these processes and. Where, where it will, will be used because we, we need we need that to get value from all all the various fractions. So I'm not sure about my time. I haven't looked at the clock, but um, if we go to the closing remarks, then I will clo close with this. So, I mean, recently there has been a lot of work on HTL and on different. They they have work on black liquors, sewage sludges. They have work on different algae oils and different lignocellulosics and there's lots of there's lots of interest but um, the the experiences from these large scale demonstration projects are lacking and from from my experience in the commercialization and scale up in order to be able to you know design a commercial plant you, you really have to have these experiences from these large scale demonstrations and so I I use a thousand hours it's it's not necessarily the the um let's say the minimum but a thousand hours online continuous online to to show that you have stable processes 
for the upgrading, it's very important because as we know, when we have a catalyst, it's very active at the start and we have to get the equilibrium activity and we have to run the catalyst long periods of time. We have to look to see if the catalyst will coke and if the catalyst pores will get blocked and how, how the, the metals remaining in the buyer crude affect the catalyst, let's say selectivity and activity. And so we really have to do these long, long run hours. And that's, that's what we did in the demonstration plant when we're doing the Fisher tropes, we gasified biomass and cleaned up the syn gas and then did a thousand hour catalyst test. And so this is, this is very important to have these long-term catalyst tests. And at the same time, then to produce large volumes of these upgraded products that can be tested and looked at. And uh, so when I'm, when I'm looking at this HTL, there is, there's obviously missing these large scale demonstration projects and the large, large volumes of um, upgraded bio crude and there, there is, there is the process uh, or the pr project on silver green fuels, and maybe, maybe that will answer some of those questions. But that waits to be seen how, how quickly they can get that project running, up and running, and who's going to be doing the upgrading. That's not so clear yet, and how, how they will then do the, do the test. But um, time, timelines. I think, I think it's still going to be some time before we, we have all the data and information that, that is needed to. Um, to be able to design um, the the commercial plants with upgrading, so that's that's what I had to say today. And hopefully, I didn't go over time, but um, I am open for questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stephen, and thanks. You were perfectly on time, so no worries about that. Uh, we also have uh, time for a few dedicated um, questions from the audience and I can read two in the chat here. Sure. So the first, the first one, Stephen, is uh, where, in which unit um, could you put the bio crude for co-processing in a conventional oil refinery? I mean, of course, it depends on the bio, the HTL bio crude quality. So there are, there, there are different units that when I was working at Neste, we, we had a so-called uh, heavies upgrader. And uh, so we, we think that the bio crudes go, could go into that, but of course, the uh, refinery processes, I just want to remind everybody that the refinery processes are interconnected and the refineries, you know, they have invested billions of years in their refineries. So they, they will not um, in, introduce these um, bio crudes unless the, the, the acidity is at the right level and um, it won't affect you know, in, in, in addition, I, I didn't state that, but in addition to the catalyst, there are all the heat exchangers and the fouling. And, and then if there is more nitrogen or sulfur than in some of the crudes, that how, how will those gases be treated? Because in the refinery, then the, the um, say, say the off gases have to be treated. And will that affect the um, re refinery off gas treatment? So there are many, many things. And uh, normally, normally you would, want to put this into a cracker or a hydro treater. But the other thing about putting them into refinery, if you put in small volumes, then the, the, the renewable carbon in those feeds is going to be diluted significantly. And it, within the European Union, we, we want high, high levels of um, renewable carbon in our fuels. And so one, one or 2% is not, not going to be very attractive. And so you would, you would um, look, look for de dedicated upgraders and do blending. And I, I, I know a lot of people are lo looking at this um, co-processing, co but of course, there are many, many challenges and um, is that the route to go? That's one, one route to go, but I wouldn't say that's the, the best, best route to go. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So I can see more questions popping up here. Uh, one is probably a follow up to what you just said. So how about the corrosion um, plugging? Etc. by phosphates and chlorides and other components. So probably that's answered by the um, uh, having a dedicated upgrading unit and then go for blending. Or do you want to add something here? That's that's what I suggest now. We, I mean, just just think about it. You've invested eight eight billion or whatever into your refinery, and you you introducing new new feeds that could up, upset the refinery. So you you wouldn't do do that lightly, and so. You would start with dedicated units, get get some experiences, and then maybe look at down the road if that that would be an option. But once again, 
going into the refinery units depends on the size of the unit, depends on how much bio crude you are diluting the renewable carbon. And so customers want high, high levels of renew, renewable carbon. Two, two or three percent, I don't think is so attractive. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here, um, or whether there are already some insights on the costs of the products. There, there have been lots of studies, but un until you have a commercial plants, then um, we, we just, just don't know. As I was saying, from it depends on the feedstock. Does somebody pay to take the feedstock like sewage sludge? And so you are sort of processing a waste and you get paid for that. And so maybe you, you don't have to look too, too much at the, at the overall yield. But if you have lignocellulose and straw, how big is, how big is the, the, the sort of a primary conversion plant? What is the cost of the feedstocks? What are your yields? What is the OPEX? I mean, there's been lots of studies, but I, I wouldn't want to venture any guesses about how it would compare to, say, um, our first generation. They're going to be more, more expensive, I would say, than fir first generation, but how much more? It's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And then maybe the last question is a follow up here. Um, so, will, what type of feedstock uh, would an HTL technology be looking into? Um, the um, the high moisture moisture feedstocks probably um... exactly yeah but just just remember this um to to be able to make a slurry you have to have fairly small particle size and so when you are trying to do size reduction on some very moist feedstocks it's very difficult so the, if it's a moist moist feedstock you'd probably want something that's already ha has a small enough par particle size but. I, I, I think they could always, you could always get a technical workaround or a technical fix. And so, of course, with even wet feedstocks that are fibrous, there's, there's different technologies to, to reduce that to, to make a slurry. Because, you know, when you, when you go into the HTL reactors, you, you want to have fairly small particles. But yeah. Okay. And there's another one which came in, which I also think interesting. Uh, so, um... Will the the final cost rather be affected more by the feedstock cost or by the greater demands for the processing of the feedstock? Do you have any guess on that? How the balance between those influences would be? I mean, you know, as everybody knows, the larger the HTL conversion plant, the longer the distances to travel, and the higher the feedstock is going to be. And so it's going to be a question of what is the optimal size of these HTL plants. You don't want to have it so large that you have to, you know, truck truck in the the, the feedstocks because the, these re residues, most of the cost for the feedstock is by the logistics. And uh, so, I mean, nobody really knows for sure right now, of course, because we haven't built built the plants, and so it it really really will will depend on the on the actual plant overall capex and then the feedstock i would say that it's shared between them fairly well the the advantage of the htl is you have high yields and so compared to fisher tropes where you need five five tons per ton of product here you could probably get away with um three, three tons of feed per product and so the feedstock maybe um will not be as as prominent in this HTL as in the gasification of fissure tropes. Thank you very much, Stephen. Very interesting uh, insights that you offered here. So uh, then I would like to turn to the next speaker. And uh, I see that I think Monica is online right now. Yes. So we could uh, turn to Monica Normack's presentation. I would like to introduce to, to you Monica Normack of CCAP. And um, what I take, she has quite a steep career here because first she was um, head of biorefinery technology and now she is chief technical officer at CCAP. So uh, our pleasure uh, to have you here, Monica. And um, please introduce you as to your technology on the conversion of lignocellulosic residues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting Sekab to be part of this uh, conference or gathering. And I think. Um, uh, I guess short, uh, short info about myself. 
um, technical doctor in chemistry and have been working with actually a background in pretreatment of lignocellulosic materials uh, and going further than to enzymatic sacrification. That is my background in, in way back. And now ending up in CECAB and leading the biorefinery platform and now also the, the CTU of, of the CECAB group. So today, I think it's, it's really nice to hear the previous uh, pre presenter then talking about HTL process and also because in, we, are, we need to see how these different solutions will, will fit together in the best way going forward. So today I will describe our biorefinery solution, what we can bring um, into the, these different solutions for lignocellulosic residues into sugar lignin ethanol platforms and the road ahead that we will have now we i mean we need we know that we need to do take some actions we know that we need to start even further more aggressively take on this green transition we will it will not take uh, this will be a long long process and and yes looking at the transportation uh, substituting the, the today with the fossil and then going into what, I mean, CECAB has, I will describe a little bit short uh, where we are today, uh, the green chemicals the trans to bio-based materials. Um, this is also very important. So yes, very short uh, info, quite quick. Uh, I don't know how familiar everybody is with CECAB. CECAB is, uh, is a mid-sized company located in north of Sweden, roughly 500 kilometers north of Stockholm, to give you a little bit geographical point. We belong actually to this uh, fantastic uh, cluster site. It was once this Moodoo pulp, sulfite pulping. Uh, and then after the split, uh, when Moodoo ended their, their sulfite pulping, different kind of companies then uh, shared different like segments in that the, that industry so CECAP took on the chemical part in a way that we, we further processed ethanol into new green chemicals so on the, this site we have actually uh, already produced this green chemical platform from ethanol and methanol when we didn't have the oil um, so we are now a little bit closing the, the loop here and doing it again now, but no, now somebody needs to pay for, for the, the products and this is the difference, but we already can do it. And SECAB has an ownership in the north of Sweden. It's Övix, the municipality energy company that owns SECAB to 70%. We have, uh, so Umi Energy, uh, Övix Energy and Skellefteå Kraft. Skellefteå Kraft is, um, uh, a town north of Örnsköldsvik where you have this battery factory now being built, this North Vault. So it's a lot of things happening in the north of Sweden now. We also work very close with academia over the years and with RISE Institute in Sweden. And yes, some very short facts about CECAB, roughly 80 employees, but we today produce 60,000 tons of chemicals and uh, roughly than 20,000 uh, cubic meters of biofuels. We export over 50 and 60% of this, not going into Sweden, we are exporting it. And we also have a I mean, large number of own patents. I mean, I will comment on this, uh, but over the years when we have developed this uh, IP portfolio and this technology, of course, we have over 200 six patterns, I think, today. So to make it really easy here, one group, three companies, same target. We have our chemical plant uh, that is more like the mother, mother company that produces and sells the, the chemicals and biofuels. And Seca B Technology is where we have developed the technology and we, where we have the operation of the demo facility. And then we created this new uh, SECA forest technology where I'm leading is our feasibility study of uh, yeah, making more ethanol, advanced ethanol and other products in Sweden from sawdust. I will give you a short description of that later. 
Uh, but what we have today, what we can offer to our clients today, I mean, we have bioasset Islehide that we sell today. We have, and we see that I, I've been with Seacab now for four years, uh, and over these four years, we've seen an increase in demand from our clients and the, their clients. And everybody wants to try to substitute to, to green uh, chemicals in the entire value chain. It's not so easy. Uh, they are lacking volumes, of course. Um, but we can at least today offer what we can in the capacity we have in Ursus Week. Uh, we'd love to we have also been public that we're increasing the capacity, biosetic acid, for example. Uh, and we will also increase the, the capacity on bioasset aldehyde. And um, I think this is really important that we now see that we've been starting 1985 and producing green chemicals more or less than not having the demand there. Now we see that uh, uh, big customers uh, and also in, in more towards, you know, consumer, I mean, products that you, for example, you know, moisture creams, etc., and, and other, uh, even into pharmaceutical materials, we need to switch. So this is uh, what we also can, can offer to the market. But today we will talk about this technology and Seller Up is a uh, platform uh, going from wood to value. Uh, but to be very clear here, this is a, a solution uh, that we have worked with different lignocellulosic biomass over the years. I mean, we have processed everything more or less uh, from, from wheat straw, bagasse, from maize residues, from uh, from all over the world, China, India, South America. Uh, this was, um, and then over the years, we have, of course, uh, a lot of trial and error starting then 2004. Now we can introduce this cell app platform. Uh, and the last years, we have actually doubled our IP portfolio. We can now say that we can target and we can also design depend on what the client uh, want. And, and different quality on the sugar, different quality on the hemicellulosic sugars and the lignin. So it's quite in a way flexible because we can um, go very deep in, in, in the knowledge in how we do this, depending on the starting material, the process, of course. And very simply put, we have a pretreatment of the lignocellulosic material. We have a separation and washing if that is what we are going with to separate hemocellulosic sugars. And we have an asthmatic hydrolysis. Uh, we, can, we can work either to, to just go on without any separation and, and into fermentation and distillation, having all the solids with us. That is something we can we all, all also do. So it depends on, on what the client wants to have. And um, more than. I heard a previous speaker saying something about demonstration facility, and I, I really agree that working in during my PhD in the lab and, and working with different pretreatment methods like ionic liquids, etc. I mean, the scalability and, and, and what happens in different steps. It's not only uh, you, you learn a lot uh, when you transport material, what happens, what will. So it's not a linear um, to scale up from different scales, going from lab or bench scale or pilot then to demonstration. So I think this, the know-how we have gained over the years and, and also the, the trial and errors and the solutions then, then that is collected in this IP portfolio. And we can apply it today. So now we can have a continuously pretreatment and we have a smooth operation online measurement. So I will take you inside this demo facility to give you some idea how it looks. Uh, so this, the, I mean, in a way it's an idea, this simple idea, but here we have uh, sawdust. We can take it into diff two different containers. We can, could be maize or other, could be bagasse, but in this we have sawdust. And just to mention, I mean, Seca being located in the north of Sweden, we have more or less softwood. So it's been 
the natural reference material for us to handling soft food and, and soft food is challenging due to the structure, this uh, matrix. Uh, and um, we, we then blow up the material to the roof. And here you can say that our knowledge really starts how to process it, how to impregnate it. Here we screw the material down to an impregnation pocket. And um, uh, we have learned a lot how to impregnate and where to impregnate. And then we have worked with steam explosion. Uh, and we use catalyst depending on the fits, the raw material ingoing. Is it softwood? We use sulfur dioxide. It's been shown and demonstrated for many years that it's the most efficient. Uh, we create them this slurry so we can we can actually have big size ships we can have big size ships and sawdust and we can still process and create a slurry like this not a problem for us we work a lot of, with particle image analysis etc that we have developed over the years and uh, here we are, have the chemical room. So we have not developed any own strain of enzymes over the years. We work with commercial available enzymes and um, tested a lot of different uh, enzyme cocktails, uh, more or less different, I mean, suitable for different raw materials. And uh, after the pretreatment, you start your enzymatic hydrolysis. And, and the important parameters, of course, is the steering and the pH and the temperature uh, that we're monitoring. And, and then the whole idea is to have available substrate for the enzyme to, to then release the monomeric sugars. And it's very important to say that SECAP then, after creating these sugars, we have also developed an, an own IP protected fermentation technology where we can ferment the same sugar four to five times faster in the same uh, if you compare it to a conventional batch fermentation. And then, to be honest, uh, if you scale this up, our technology, using our technology, we are more or less producing lignin plants. Uh, we have a hydrolysis lignin fraction that is very uh, big. We will have lignin. It, the lignin will contain, of course, uh, some cellulose, but uh, more or less uh, non-sulfur. It's very, very. We have a very small amount of natural sulfur, and, and using our pretreatment, it will be almost sulfur-free. But this lignin then uh, can be suitable for different material due to the composition of, of of the lignin. So different types of lignin are existing on the market. We have hydrolysed lignin derived then from steam explosion technology. And it's very important that we can put that into use, uh, the best use uh, that is suitable for this kind of lignin. And the, depending on the pretreatment and, and how you do your pretreatment, targeting what kind of lignin you would like to have and what kind of downstream uh, processing, processing you will continue with, this is one of our core knowledge to, to tailor the pretreatment to know. And we really, I mean, our technology now, we are up in eight, over 80% of yield in total yield of, from wood, dry wood into sugar, and also reach for certain different feedstock over 90% in total yields conversion. So we are getting there. But something that is worth pointing out that in, the impact factor of successful pretreatment, because the pretreatment will be the main step that also will then, um, you know, derive in, in the, uh, different compounds or different furan complex that you will need to handle downstream and, and also in your wastewater treatment. So this is something that we uh, really focus on to, to understand the downstream process and, and how to handle that, scaling up this technology now. And I will just mention some applications. Uh, SECAB has over the years been involved in, in different EU projects where we have demonstrated that we have both produced a lot of sugar. Then we're talking about one product like over 50 tons of dry sugars, um, hardwood sugars. We have 
softwood sugars into uh, 30, 40 tons of dry matter uh, sugars. And, and I will just describe very short. We have one that we demonstrated, both hardwood sugars produced under cellar up and softwood sugars can be used into, this was a project with Avangem and Metken, into then bioplastic bottles. Um, we also been working with bioplastic in, in PLA using our sugars derived from cellar up. I will not spend so much time on this, but it's very interesting that I just want to stress that this kind of sugar platform that we can create, you can work with so many different, the, the, even if you talk about now more advanced ethanol being the main product, but in the future, you have a, a whole variety of, of products that you can go to. You, it's not that you, when you process it, you can't go back. Here we actually can design uh, and take out different products. In this Revo Fuel product, we work with uh, different industrial players and we aim to demonstrate that we can use the softwood residues, sawdust uh, or wood chips from softwood and, and produce isobutene from the sugars that we have produced in Nurses Week uh, together with Global Bioenergies and then further then together with Neste and Repsol uh, convert it into drop-in biofuels and then work with Sky Energy for the aviation fuels. I think it's really interesting to demonstrate. And so we have actually sent a lot of sugars over the, the last three years here to downstream to Europe. And the lignin fraction, I will go into that uh, later, but that has been worked with HIPEA to see if this application for uh, asphalt payment will be one solution. And we come to the lab to commercialization. I mean, we are in this demo scale phase and we are now want to commercialize and, and build biorefinery together with Prash Industries uh, in India that are our partner in this. They can, they have over 75, I think over uh, 700 reference. They are now building uh, four commercial projects in India for advanced biofuels. So together with Prash, and we, if we put together everything we have, we are quite similar in a way, more that they, they have also pilot and demo plants. We know the, the years that it takes to scale up and also introducing something new, integrate and optimization uh, that is required for a successful business case. And um, the lignin now, now in Sweden, we have actually done now three payments with the hydrolysis lignin directly in the ground, in the asphalt, together with PF. And we are working also in, in, in the Netherlands with BMI, Van Gelder, and see what we can do there. Just to have reference, uh, this, uh, yeah, some reference and see how it works. We need, the, we need a lot of years of development there, but this is something that we can test. Since we can produce a lot of uh, tons of lignin in Anxious Week. So the time is right for the development. And so CECAP has the plans to in Sweden to increase the amount of advanced ethanol, we want to produce a biorefinery uh, that can also produce crude lignin oils uh, for the mar maritime sector. We will end up with uh, 146,000 uh, tons of lignin, but we also will create biogas liquefied. And also we will have biogenic CO2 that we are in discussion to see if we can further turn it into ethanol since we are an ethanol company that really needs ethanol as a feedstock. Um, so this is the plan and the operational uh, startup is in end of 2025. Investment decision in roughly June 2023. So it's a debate ongoing of using lignocellulosic material today in the EU. And, and we have, of course, we can process everything. We have been very focused on the soft load residues, um, like sawdust or, or wood chips that is the leftover, the waste. So if you are creating or you're building houses or want to have a carbon capture in, in building in wood, of course, you will have sawdust. And, and we want to offer a solution that we can do a lot of different products for just one ton of sawdust. It's not only one. 
here we can offer at least five just during our process. So I just want to leave you with that. Uh, if we can't use the lignus elusive material or the waste, I mean, how are we going to meet the, the volumes that we are required? Even if we use different technology, of course, we, we, we would need some of these uh, residues to going, going forward. So we are a little bit also wondering what roads should we take in the future. And, and I, I strongly believe that it's a mix, of course, and on different regions uh, where you are located in the world and what, what is best suitable. Um, going looking at the raw material ingoing and the logistics and etc needs to be uh, energy savings and everything so i just want to thank you all for listening and if you have any question please go ahead thank you thank you monica very interesting presentation uh, a lot of details and um, i see that you have uh, a very flexible technology here uh, we had quite some technical questions coming in, but we don't have the time to address those. So I'm going to pick just just one question from all of these and please be brief with your reply. Um, so the, the pretreatment you say is really the heart uh, because it's, it defines um, the compounds that you will be using afterwards. Um, but the pretreatment, the steam explosion is very needs a lot of energy. So, how do you balance this high costs um, and the high energy consumption um, to be able to produce a competitive product then? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is really true. So, so this is why also it's very important when we, I mean, when we look at us big scale in, in Sweden, if you're going to go with that product, it's the, the largest softwood by refinery than existing. So, it requires the energy prices is of course very important and that you have um so we are looking into solutions where we can have a, you know a steam excess we are close to a partner that have green energy so in sweden we work with hydropower we have a lot of wind power so this is this needs to be this is not something that's good to have we need to have it so um, I think that is one key, of course, uh, in the business case to have a sustainable energy solution and work with different maybe mixes or solar, wind, hydropower in, in that way. So this is something that we are looking into, but it's very true that the steam explosion by itself requires a, a high pressure steam on, on that operation. That is true. So, of course, we have tried to balance that and, and of course, the lower price on, on the energy is better. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, we will now turn over to our next presenter, uh, which is Sylvain Verdier of Halder Topse. And I have no idea whether I have pronounced the name correctly or not. Spot on, <laughs> Thank Dina. Spot on. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I just realized that you have a podcast, Fuel for Thought. So, um... yes, we do. <laughs> I should probably um, uh, listen in to one of those. You don't have to. One time. <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, yes, yeah. we should. No, but, no. Um, I'll talk about so... it actually at the end of the presentation because ah, uh, it's, a not, it's only technical things. So we don't promote ourselves. It's really knowledge based. It's technical. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm interested. Exactly. I'm looking but... forward. And um, you're going to take us on yes. um, the state of co processing. Indeed. In... So, yeah. yeah. Tis, can you yes. run the show or the slides for me or should I do it? If you can do it by yourself, it's fine. So you have the rights to do so. If you can share PowerPoint, yes, look at that. No technical glitch yet. Okay, let me know when you can see the screen. I think you we can, can see, see the screen. Yes. Excellent. Perfect. Cool. And that's yes. perfect, Silva. Please go cool. ahead. Okay, and you stop me. I have a lot of slides. I speak a lot. So ah, okay, so I stop you early. Good. <laughs> Just mute me. Uh, but it's good to be here and talk to uh, all of you today. I don't know how much all of you know about co processing and the uh, basic challenges. So I try to make something yeah, high level. Maybe it's too basic for you, but yeah, I apologize for that ahead. Uh, so I work for a Danish company called Hello Topser. I've been working there for 15 years. I'm not Danish, as you can hear, but uh, it doesn't matter. So today we talk about co processing of virgin oils, waste oil and fats, and advanced feedstocks. So, Stephen, 
talked about FTL oil, which and he addressed actually a lot of things that uh, I would mention today, but the challenges and solution. So, okay, let's start with the, uh, sorry, I'm moving things on the screen. Yes, let's start with the take home message in case some of you have to leave earlier. So feedstocks, and you all know that, but I'm just summarizing. Different renewable feedstocks would demand different catalyst and process consideration. If I have, uh, I don't know, rapeseed oil or HTL oil, of course, cannot be the same unit, cannot be the same catalyst loading. They have different challenges, but we'll talk, uh, we'll touch upon that. Uh, first, what we call first and second generations so with virgin oil and waste oil and fats. This is known, this has been done for years. Proposing challenges can be handled with proper know how, catalyst, and technology. So I'll show you some examples. And uh, co processing, uh, I think we have uh, the latest unit we revamped for Prim in uh, Gothenburg. It's 85% co processing with crude alloy. So it's possible with the right uh, know how and technology. The next challenge, and we've been working on that for some years now, it's co processing of pyrolysis oil, HTL oil, and it's new challenges. You have the existing one from the first second generation, but you have actually uh, a few ones to deal with. And uh, Stephen has mentioned, talked about that, like miscibility, stability, and the product quality. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yes, so introduction. This is how we see in terms of first, second, and third generation feedstocks. I think there's a lot of definition out there. So bear with us for this. But first generation, so it's rapeseed oil, palm oil, sunflower, soybean oil. Uh, second generation, so waste oil and fats. What is used now, it's mostly used cooking oil, a bit of animal fat. In the US, you have this corn oil, which is a byproduct from ethanol production. Crude oil, it's mostly in, uh, in the Nordics. And you have some uh, palm oil uh, effluents. But we know that there's limited amount of feedstock, first and second generation. I think it's 160 million tons per year. Uh, all in all for the yeah, virgin oils used worldwide and are produced worldwide and second generation were around 40 million tons per year. So if we are converting all of this, let's say we forget food, feed, everything just for biofuels, we could maybe produce three, four million barrels per day with just this. It's not a lot. And we also have sustainability uh, criteria. So it's all about the third generation feedstocks. And here we define this in three categories. So solid waste biomass, uh, and here are some examples, agricultural residue, forestry residue, sewage sludge, uh, municipal solid waste. You have these rotational winter crops, Carinata, Castor, Pongomia, I don't know, you name it. And then the recycled uh, carbon, so plastic waste and the end of life types. And basically, in theory, you can, and this is just what we do in terms of, this is the only slide I will talk about uh, what we do as a company. But basically, so first and second generation with pre treatment, and then you have hydro processing technology, you can produce renewable fuels. So gasoline, uh, NAFTA, actually, renewable NAFTA is getting some. Uh, the last couple of months or years, some movement, but of course, diesel, jet fuel, and the marine fuel is also working up slowly. But to go back to this solid waste and third generation feedstock, you have technologies such as yeah, pyrolysis, hydrothermal liquefaction, and here the, we are doing fixed bed uh, hydroprocessing technology, so we go for fixed bed, we don't go for FCC. But this is what we have been working on, and uh, you have to be able to do some uh, yeah, upgrading of this. Gasification route, Stephen mentioned fissure traps, and it's also some technologies that exist out there and uh, we're also working on this. But I will mostly talk today about how to processing and co-processing in fixed bed units. It's all about chemistry. I think many of you are chemists of chemical background, so uh, I'm trained as a chemical engineer, so I also know a bit of chemistry, although it's a bit far back. But yeah, vegetable oils, fatty acids, uh, Waste oil and fats, it's fatty acid and free fatty acids, so more acidic. And here's the complexity will increase slowly. So crude alloy, uh, you have some resin and neutral, some, some ring structures, but also a lot of free fatty acids, much higher uh, acid number can go to 200. Fisher troughs, it's non-technology, it can be upgraded, but this pyrolysis oil and HDL oil have a very different chemistry. Depending on the feedstock, it's very much feedstock dependent, as you know, a lot of different compounds, and this will affect the upgrading strategies. So it's really about chemistry. As you, you have to understand your feed, and then you can decide what uh, different approach is. We often start with this slide when we talk to customers about okay, they said okay, we have this feedstock, we want to produce renewable fuels. So we said okay, you have two options: either you do co-processing or standalone, meaning 100% of a renewable feedstock. So co-processing. Option one: you don't want to co-process too much. 
rule of thumb, max to 10%. Here you can basically, with a catalyst loading, so you don't need major revamp, or actually no revamp at all, depending on when you inject the feed, and it's every unit is different. So, But about 10%, basically, with a catalyst, you can uh, handle this. So the idea is to, and now we talk about that, you have to handle contaminants, and then uh, maybe a bit of, yeah. But it's uh, this is an option, just catalyst. If you want more than 10%, you are likely to need uh, more revamp for heat exchange, it's more exothermal, you have possibly more corrosion issues. So it, this is more challenging. And here grassroots, I've not seen many grassroots you need going for core processing. So it's mostly revamp and uh, yeah, catalyst loading. And then standalone, I won't talk about today too much, but it's basically a, yeah, either a revamp or grassroots of a unit, and then you go for 100%. What we see globally is that in US, people are going much more for grassroots unit, uh, sorry, but for standalone units, 100%. In EU, it's a long time since we've heard a, a big grassroots uh, 100% standalone plants. People are doing more core processing. When we talk to customers, what I hear is that people, although RED2 is in place, RED3 coming, many member state legislation is not fully in place and there's some uncertainty. So people said, okay, core processing, we have this uh, blending fuel obligation, we'll go for core processing, it's safer, lower investment. So that's really. We see a lot of uh, co-processing in the EU. Of course, it's done uh, in different parts of the world, but that's really the trend we've seen the last year, co-processing. Okay. Yes, so here, this is basically the different challenges you have when you process uh, renewable feedstocks, so first and second generation. And this was addressed briefly before. So you have pressure drops due to contaminant. Phosphorus is a big enemy, as you possibly all know. Basically, phosphorus make this phosphate glass, and then, make some yeah, blocks, uh, prevent access to the pores, and then it forms a plug, so you will have basically pressure drop. And also it can uh, yeah, deactivate the catalyst because you don't have access to the pores. So, and the other metals and alkali metals will get stuck. And it's a, yeah, it's a resistive recipe for disaster if you have too high phosphorus. Uh, it's very exothermic. Let's say, I don't know, uh, fixed bed, um, Diesel, fossil diesel, hydrotreater, maybe you have a delta T of 40 degree, 50 overall in your different beds in your reactor with virgin oil or waste oil and fats, depending on the amount of double bond and how uh, reactive is, it is maybe 200 degree C to handle. So you really need to handle these uh, exothems. It's a, it's a big, big challenge for refineries initially. Of course, this can be handled. I will go through solutions for each of these issues later. Four call for properties for diesel, depending on the feedstock you use and the coal flow property of your fossil diesel. Maybe after more than 10%, give or take, you will need some deworking catalyst because you will have your cloud point and pop point will increase. If you co-process to produce jet fuel, this is also something we've heard the last two years, 1% it's enough to see an increase in your freezing point. So here coal flow properties can be a challenge. Uh, if you use, uh, yeah, when you produce CO, so you have different routes. Either you remove the oxygen uh, as water, so it's HDO route, hydro deoxygenation, or you go the decarboxylation route. So basically, you, one carbon goes to make CO2, and then you have a water, water gas shift, methanation, you form some CO. And here, some catalysts are inhibited by CO. So it can also be an issue if you have a, a unit using a Como catalyst, and I will touch about that later. Corrosion issues, so you have three types of corrosion. You have uh, yeah, acid corrosion, the standard one from the yeah, free fatty acids. Then you have carbonic acid corrosion because you form CO2 and you have water. So it's in the uh, downstream section. And you also have chlorine induced corrosion also in the uh, downstream section. So those yeah, are challenges and you need to look at it when you want to do some core processing studies. Hydraulic limitation, uh, do you have enough hydrogen and so forth? Those are really, really ch challenges too. But of course, there are solutions. As I said, co processing has been done for a long time. So, yes, I can see my answer, but I remember it. Yes. Uh, so, the point about phosphorus basically, feed pretreatment, as Stephen mentioned, is critical. And depending on the unit, the catalyst loading, the cycle lengths you have, you have different yeah, PPM uh, requirements from the catalyst vendors. I cannot give values, but we are below 10 ppm by far, possibly below 5 ppm phosphorus. It's really what's important. Of course, you need, uh, 
we have developed Catalyst to uh, pick up more phosphorus. So we launched something last year, Catalyst TK3000, where basically phosphorus doesn't stay on the surface, but we have uh, penetration of the phosphorus across the whole pellet. So that's really uh, a big game changer for us and for our customers because we can extend cycle lengths and also accept a bit more uh, pickups of uh, phosphorus. Uh, exothermic reactions, so you have different, yeah, normally you have, we say dilution is a solution. Uh, so either you inject a different bed and you can also recycle with a product if you uh, if you can do that. That's, you need to absorb this heat. So you need heat sink to, to deal with that. Again, if you could process a slow amounts, it's easier to handle because it's uh, yeah, less exothermic. For cold flow properties, you can use a de-icing catalyst. It can be, in the, if you have a one reactor only, you can use some uh, base metal catalyst so in sour mode. If you have a unit that have a sweet um, section, so no H2S, no ammonia, here you can use a noble metal catalyst, and it has to be very selective depending on the product you want to do. Can it, catalyst inhibition due to CO, so a COMO, as I mentioned, can be inhibited uh, due to um, uh, CO, but if you use actually HDO catalyst selective, so it means you don't form CO, you can prevent formation of CO maybe 95% HDO and 5% decarboxylation. So basically you mean you form little CO and your catalyst is unlikely to be inhibited. We are doing co-processing in some COMO unit at low pressure and we see very little inhibition because we had the proper uh, loading system. Corrosion issues, well, it's all about, yeah, metallurgy and um, yeah, material selection. I've heard some refineries who are basically deacidifying the feedstock. So they basically, they have a feedstock that have a lot of free fatty acid and they make fame out of it. So they kind of esterify and then they co-process that. <laughs> it's a bit yeah, funny to do that because you make a biodiesel and then you have to treat that to make renewable diesel. So in terms of greenhouse gas emission, it might not be optimum, but yeah, we've heard a few examples of people doing that. And then if you use, uh, to prevent carbonic acid corrosion, again, if you use the HDO route, you form water and not CO2, you also minimize your uh, carbonic acid formation or corrosion issues. And the next point, basically, if you have hydraulic limitation, low hydrogen availability, you need a revamp of the unit and it's a much bigger project and much more expensive. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll keep talking. Uh, we have done, and not only us, but we have done co-processing. You know, our customers have been doing co-processing for many years. So here I listed some typ typical feedstocks, virgin oils. So yeah, typical uh, virgin oils you can see, and then waste and fat, also a lot of them uh, for co-processing range. So just with the catalytic solution, so you just basically do a proper catalyst loading, two to ten percent of co-processing. If you go to higher amounts you are likely to do a revamp. Yeah, I found one example in our reference list. We did a small revamp for, it was very specific unit, so we had to do a revamp for 5%, but normally it's more than 10%, you need to do a, a revamp for the issues I mentioned. Units and products, so low and high pressure units can be used, NEMO, COMO, Catalyst. It's not a problem with the right loading. And uh, as you might know, you can co-process to produce jet fuel, but it's maximum 5% of the feedstock to be certified according to the D1655. And we see more and more questions. Uh, the last two years, we've had a lot of customers asking, can we co-process uh, biofeedstock to produce jet? Now let's get to the core of it, the advanced feedstocks. They have uh, new challenges. And here uh, we just took from, yeah, typical properties. I think we looked at, uh, yes. So let's take diesel. No oxygen, as you know, fossil diesel, uh, high hydrogen content, we like that. Uh, some sulfur, of course, and uh, yeah, low nitrogen content. This is a diesel product. Vegetable oil, or uh, waste and fats, yeah, hydrogen content, uh, oxygen 10, 12%. And here we start the challenging feedstock. So uh, Stephen mentioned the HTL oil, depending on the feedstock, the process, you can be 10, 20% of oxygen and hydrogen content will vary too. If you have sewage sludge, for example, or algae, you can have really high nitrogen content. We had a, we analyzed some feedstock with six, seven percent nitrogen, and here this can be an issue because all the units are integrated somehow in the refinery, and you don't want to send something that will affect the other units later. And high hydrogen consumption for when you produce, uh, when you have to treat fossil diesel, let's say straight run diesel, maybe you use 100, 150 normal cubic meter of hydrogen per cubic meter of a feedstock. Vegetable oils. 300, 350, and here you can see it's really 
increasing and the goal is because of course you have less hydrogen in the feed you need to put it up so that can really be uh, in terms of price in terms of greenhouse gas emissions it's a challenge and it's expensive but that's what it takes if you want to make uh, transport fuel and yes pyrolysis catalytic pyrolysis catalytic hydropyrolysis they have different uh, yeah, oxygen content hydrogen content and i won't spend too much time on this but they're also a typical feedstock we have looked at Again, different chemistry, different oxygenate. It's not only about total oxygen content, it's also about the chemistry. We know that some feedstocks are less stable when you hit up at 100, 150, 200. We know we have polymerization, condensation reactions. We know some which groups are re responsible for that. So it's really about understanding the oxygenates in your feedstock to decide on the upgrading strategy. But what are the typical issues besides what I mentioned before about pressure drop, exhaust and mental force? Is it miscible? And often it is not. So that's why you might need a bit of stabilization and then it could be miscible. Is it stable? Again, some feedstocks, we know fast pyrolysis oil are not always stable if you hit about 100, 150. So it, it can be a challenge. Pretreatments, uh, we talked to a lot of the pretreatment companies, the one doing uh, yeah, bleaching, adsorption, and so forth. They have not all looked at this advent feedstock. So will the standard pretreatment technologies work for such feedstock when you have emulsions? Viscosity can be an issue. I think there's still a lot of work to be done on a pretreatment of such feedstocks. Of course, there will be bad variations. We see that already with uh, use cooking oil, but bad variation might be an issue. And the logistics, it's always the, yeah, where do we build this, let's say, HTL or power disease unit? Is it next to the refineries, next to the feedstocks? What makes sense? And so forth. Uh, hydrogen consumption, and those are the typical issues I mentioned. High hydrogen consumption would be much higher than uh, virgin oil if you want to produce the same product. Let's say you want to make marine fuel, maybe you don't need as much hydrogen because the specs are more flexible. But if you want to make SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, although it's not approved uh, these pathways, you might need uh, much more hydrogen. Uh, exotherms, very exothermic reactions, a lot of corrosion. Uh, acid number, but we've had experience with a typical acid number of 200. So this can be done commercially. CO, CO2 water, pressure drops, and so forth. And again, which yield would you get? Uh, where will it end up in the product? How will it affect the rest of the refineries? What will be the product properties? Cloud point, aromatic content, you name it. And of course, what would be the greenhouse gas savings, especially depending on the type of hydrogen you use. Dina, I can see you. So I guess I have to round it up. Uh, okay, it's an example. I won't go into detail. We published that. Uh, we did some experiments where we co-processed uh, um, reactive catalytic fast pyrolysis oil, 10% oxygen, and we co-processed 5, 15, 20% with a standard NEMO catalyst, standard, it's a bit on the high end pressure for a diesel unit. Uh, but this, the presentation will be available, Dina, right? So people can look at it, and uh, it was published, as I said, but we didn't see deactivation. It was blended, we could run a thousand hours. It was similar more to LCO, so light cycle oil, the upgrading in terms of hydrogen content, hydrogen consumption, product properties. It was really, yeah, it was, we were quite happily surprised. It's one of the one of the good tests we've done with uh, such feedstocks. Of course, 10% of oxygen is low, but uh, we're quite happy with this. So I'll skip and summarize. I talked about that already. As Dina said, we have a podcast, so you can listen to that. And uh, and again, it's we don't talk about ourselves. It's really technology based. So we have guests. We had last one last week about feedstock availability. We had it season three. We had some on pyrolysis, hydrothermal liquefaction, uh, legislation, and so forth. We also have webinars you can check, and we have a knowledge center, on our website. Dina, it's time to breathe now. <laughs> I too fast. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, Silva. Thank you. A lot You're of welcome. interesting information here. Yes. Okay. I stop sharing. Okay. Um, and some questions too. So we we uh, have a bit of time for mm -hmm. um, addressing one of the questions. Um, mm -hmm. I see two questions here in the chat. One is uh, you can answer um, in the chat. I think just. Um, yeah hydrogen consumption to produce fossil diesel from crude oil if you just type it in the chat afterwards please yeah, call i'll do that um but the other one is so um I, th I guess it's about what are the differences when you go into the hydro cracker or the fcc or um different places in the refinery yes. just just a brief insight Quickly, on that one, yeah. please. so what we know is yeah 
for high oxygen content feedstock that are not blendable with a fossil feedstock, FCC is a place to start. We know Prim is doing a test run now with a pyrolysis oil. But a lot of it will end up in coke. I think Petrobras published a lot of work on that. I think it's 25% end up or 30% end up as a liquid and the rest not. So it's, uh, let's see what the delegated act about co-processing says is how do you measure your product? Is it mass balance based or do you have to do biogenic carbon? If it's biogenic carbon, it's a problem because a lot will end up in CO2 or coke. When I talked to refineries, they said many of them have fixed bed, not all of them as FCC. They said, we want these feedstocks to be blended, uh, in, injected in our fixed bed units or hydro processing units. And the question was, the main difference is, okay. Uh, but you know that when you put these feedstocks, from a technical point of view, as we can solve it, I think we're very close to, to having a solution. But it will affect the unit. And often a hydro cracker is a money maker. So do you really want to put already designed in your hydro cracker, I'm not quite sure. So I think it's not technical consideration only that will decide where you inject. It's also economical and uh, pragmatic consideration. Okay, let's leave it at that. Thank you, Silver. <laughs> and you got quite some positive comments even on the on the podcast. Uh, I have a lot of friends here, that's why. <laughs> Good. Um, so then we turn to the um, fourth presentation uh, of this session. And please mind that we have a bit of time for a panel discussion afterwards. So uh, we, we can still ask a few questions to the panelists. Uh, but let me now introduce Senai Mesfun, who is a researcher at RISE. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, for the uh, in the support project for the ET Bioenergy Platform, uh, we're doing some work uh, to to bring condensed information out to the public domain. And um, Senai has been working on a review of uh, biomass to liquid via Fischer Tropsch, and he will share um, the main the main highlights of this with us. So Senai, Senai, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Dina. Do you hear me clearly? Yes, I do. And uh, I could see your picture at least before. How about now? But please, just go ahead. I can also yeah. see your presentation. Yeah, great. So, uh, my name is uh, Sanai Mosfun. Uh, I am a researcher uh, at RISE, Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, today, I'll be presenting uh, a literature review on uh, fissure tropes uh, that uh, we did uh, under the support of the ATP Energy Platform uh, Stakeholders Program. Uh, and this presentation will be uh, to, to a large extent uh, from that uh, review, which is available uh, on the ATIP website as well. Yeah, uh, when when I uh, get tasked with this uh, assignment, it was not really clear for uh, forward uh, how to proceed. As you can see here, uh, a simple search in Google Scholar for the keyword biomass to liquid uh, showed around two, 2.6 million uh, articles and patterns together, collectively for the past three decades. And as, been, as you can see in this, uh, the diagram has been intensifying uh, over the past two decades, especially the research in this field, and simply adding FT to the keyword uh, resulted also the same profile, but uh, somehow an order of magnitude lower. But as you can see, it was clear that we needed to have a certain criteria in order to make this task manageable. And for that purpose, uh, we have uh, devised certain criteria. Of course, the first one was to uh, focus on fuel stocks that qualify the renewable energy directives according to the Annex 9A and 9B. It's mostly forest residue, agricultural residue, and wastes, basically. And then uh, there was also a need to uh, narrow uh, where to look at, which type of uh, configurations, uh, and of course, uh, that there are a number of uh, biomass to liquid via fissure tropes uh, developments undergoing at the moment. Also, we try to pick on those that are happening in the EU mostly, but then also uh, on a global level. The same for the experimental activities in this area. Uh, we try to narrow it down by focusing on 
experiments conducted uh, on uh, actual singers both EU and global, but I'm not going to uh, present the experimental activities here. You can find them in the report. Then there is also uh, a third uh, uh, activity in this uh, literature review, which was feasibility study that lead to first of its kind BLT installations uh, in EU and techno economy studies that led to some sort of measurable uh, economic indicator that can be compared as well. But all these are available, as I said, in the report, which is shown also on this slide, the link to that report. So uh, why do we need advanced bio biofuels for uh, the, the research in this area has been intensifying based on uh, the sectors which are uh, deemed really uh, difficult to decarbonize in the uh, uh, short and medium term type perspective. At least the aviation and marine uh, are among those, but also heavy duty vehicles would do care certain uh, share of uh, advanced biofuels as well. So uh, in this prime, it is showing that uh, with the possibility or with the ease on to electrification, well, uh, small vehicle uh, fleet as well as rail is relatively easy, but uh, for the others, there, there would be a need for advanced biofuels. And in terms of technologies, especially the aviation industry is quite uh, picky on that because there is certain uh, uh, test standards that have to pass. Uh, luckily, uh, fissure tops vehicles are through certain pathways, of course, uh, are uh, qualified. So as you can see uh, by the green uh, bars here, FTLUC can cover uh, almost all the advanced biofuel sectors, but other biofuels as well as such as SNG and methanol can also be uh, used in the heavy uh, transport fuel as well as marine sectors. Uh, after that, we have also looked into the availability of biofuels. There is a, a report which was recently published after uh, we concluded the literature review, but there was some citations to previous works upon which uh, this uh, uh, study performed by the uh, consultants of Imperial College London uh, also based on. As you can see here, the availability of EU27 and the UK uh, of biomass from the different sectors that are uh, part of this uh, uh, red two annex nine A and B in million terms of oil equivalent for the uh, time perspective of 2030 and 2050. Under of course different scenarios where the the low case refers to low level of biomass mobilization and the medium is for uh, improved mobilization, especially in countries where cropping and forestry can be uh, improved. And the third one is for uh, high level uh, mobilization as well as uh, coupled to improvement in cropping and forestry as well. Uh, and the main conclusion from that uh, report was that uh, there is enough fuel stock available to produce advanced biofuels, especially for the aviation as well as the marine sectors. And of course, uh, a small amount that can go also to the road transport sector, which is shown on the right uh, diagram here. And as you can see, the availability increases uh, in these scenarios with low, medium and high uh, biomass mobilization activities. And out of this, one can uh, estimate based on a reasonable uh, technology uh, readiness level for the two year 2030 and 2050, the amount of biofuels that can be produced uh, from under these three scenarios. The low end of this biofuel, of course, uh, is for the uh, low mobilization case and the high end is for the high mobilization case. And What's important for us in these uh, numbers is that fisiotropes will be and will remain to be uh, the largest contributor in the production of biofuels, even though uh, hydrothermal liquefaction as well as paralysis are to be expected to contribute, especially in the time horizon 2050. 
but all the numbers behind these figures can be found in the report shown in this link, which will be shared, I think, afterwards. Uh, then I will uh, like to give you heads up or just a quick introduction to the process that we focused on, which is the FT uh, value chain from biomass or from it could be also any other fuel stock that can be classified for that matter and the different process steps that has to undergo in order to uh, arrive at the final products. But that's not my main uh, interest in this slide. I, I won't show that FT uh, products are uh, not uh, all, they are over a range of hydrocarbon chain lengths, as you can see in the figure uh, down here. Uh, we have, depending on how the reactor is operated or, or and also the, how, the type of catalyst which is being used, the temperature and the pressure, there could be different uh, chain lengths uh, and alloys it will produce a mix of those. So uh, there is a need for recycling part of these light compounds that are produced in the FT process directly to the single conditioning in order to increase the, the overall productivity, but also cracking with hydrogen for the uh, heavy components that will be produced as well, so that the intermediate uh, chain lengths that are fit to the transport fluid that we have today uh, can be satisfied. But uh, totally to avoid the undesired chain lengths is quite difficult, even though certain catalysts, as uh, Silvan already mentioned, that can improve the, uh, the productivity of the, the, the chain lengths required for a certain, for example, the aviation industry or the diesel range. That's possible to, to fine tune the process, but totally to avoid the other uh, fractions is uh, impossible. With that, I will jump to presenting the different commercial developments that are happening in the EU, as well as global. I will start with those that are uh, happening in the EU. If we can consider UK still to be part of the EU, of course. <laughs> uh, there is this uh, uh, commercial plant uh, in the UK, uh, Alta Alto, which is uh, aimed uh, to produce uh, primarily sustainable aviation fuel, but as I said, since FT has selectivity problem, there will be also additional NAFTA and other components produced. Uh, and recently, Falkstrom also announced the first potential plant in North Point, Stanlow, again in the UK, which will be aiming at producing uh, primarily SAF uh, from uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, there is also one by a TFL, uh, that has been ha for some time uh, happening in, in France in two sites where the first part of the uh, pretreatment part was uh, uh, in Venet, but the gasification and the FT process are located at Dunkirk. There are other uh, pilot plants like in Fiu Vienna and the Gusing plant in Austria, which I'm not going to present details about that. And there were also a number of uh, projects financed by under the EU uh, 2020 horizon. Uh, the Glamour, which looked at the production of uh, uh, SAF or FT liquids from uh, byproduct glycerol, the, the Comsin, the compact synthesis process, which also looked at production of FT liquids from uh, biomass, first series, but through ECOL. A compact reactor system for decentralized or for potential decentralized production. And the ICO2 CHEM, which focused on uh, sourcing industrial produce of CO2 to, to produce uh, FT liquids by uh, reverse shifting using external hydrogen, primarily sourced from electrolysis process. Uh, but now I will go through the major commercial plants, their capacity, and their status uh, at the moment. There is a little bit more detail about the Alta Alto uh, plant. It's a collaboration between British, uh, British Airways, Shell, and Velocis. 
the feed capacity is uh, about 500,000 uh, tons per year of municipal salt waste retreated, probably pelletized before the gasification and the FT process. And it aims at producing around uh, 60 million uh, liters of uh, SAF and, uh, of course, diesel and NAFTA are co produced as well, primarily will be SAF. The technology is the TRI, uh, the thermochemical. Uh, Recovery international uh, gasification process. There will be a partial oxidation unit to uh, cl clear or uh, clean the single afterwards, and then FT synthesis is supplied from Velocis with upgrading from Alder Topsoil. Uh, the next plant is Falcon Nose Point, which is recently announced, uh, and the partners in that project are SR Oils from the UK, uh, Falcon. Uh, Bioenergies, uh, the AUS uh, enterprise, uh, aiming at producing uh, primarily SAF, but uh, in general, FT liquids from uh, solid wastes. And then the city of Stanlow. Uh, the fit is not uh, explicitly specified for that, but one can uh, uh, recalculate based on the uh, aim total production of uh, liquid SAF. Uh, 100 million in this case, which is probably going to be much bigger than what Fulcrum has built in uh, Sierra uh, in uh, Nevada, the, the United States, which is which produce about 30. Uh, uh, yeah. But I, I will come to that number anyway. Then uh, the gasification technology is TRI, it's the same as the Alta Alta case, but the FT supplier in this case is uh, John, uh, the Johnson MRT. Uh, BP FT technology. And the budget, estimated budget for that project is uh, around uh, 600 million pounds. Uh, that you can go uh, in this link, you can find uh, more details about uh, this project. The biotech field, I think most of you are aware this since it has been uh, started quite some time back. But as uh, earlier I mentioned, it's located in uh, two sites, the pretreatment process, which is composed of porofaction and uh, grinding is located at the net site. And then the torrified gro ground by field stock is uh, transported to uh, Dunkirk where it's gasified using in-train flow uh, gasification technology and then synthesized to the final products. The budget of that project was around 190 million euros. And there are some plants also uh, happening outside EU, mostly in the United States, but also uh, in Japan recently joined with Velocis that has announced, but it's early stage. Uh, but there is also one uh, Australian uh, project, which is named as uh, Australia's Groundbreaking Bioenergy uh, Facility, which aims also at producing SAF. Uh, I start with the biofuel, uh, biofuels uh, plant, which is located at uh, uh, Nantes, Mississippi. The field stock for that case is woody biomass. The aim is to produce under 33 million liters of uh, total FT liquids per year, about 70%, 72% of it is SAF. Uh, now, the status in the project is the pre fit and federal per permitting are completed. Uh, they, they, they hope to close the, the, the financial target in the first quarter of next year. More details is available at their website, biofields.com. Uh, the Red Rock Biofields is another uh, project developed by uh, Red Rock uh, in the Lake View facility in Oregon, the United States again. It's a woody biomass based with uh, an input or intake of biomass about 166 kiloton per year, dry basis. And the aim for that is to produce uh, 61 million liters of uh, SAF and diesel. The uh, Falcrum, the Sierra plant, which is completed now, uh, is uh, also located in the United States in Nevada. 
Uh, their aim is to produce about 42 million liters of uh, renewable fuels per year from municipal solid waste, uh, about 175 kiloton per year dry uh, basis. The construction for that site is completed uh, currently in this year, and hopefully they, they are looking forward to start production. And as I mentioned earlier, there is one uh, huge uh, project that has been developed in Australia at the moment. It's called this uh, AG Bio Energy. It's in Victoria, Australia. They are aiming at producing 150 million liters of renewable fuels, uh, primarily diesel, but also SAF, as well as renewable electricity and liquid carbon dioxide for industrial purpose primarily for food production. Uh, their technology is not clearly stated, but uh, they, they, they mentioned that they will be combination of pyrolysis process and FT, uh, but it's not clear how this process is uh, laid out or will be laid out. And the budget they have is uh, 2 billion Australian, Australian dollars, which is about one point. 31.4 billion US dollars equivalent. First production they have already in 2021, and the full capacity is expected uh, in 2023. Yeah, with that, I will uh, jump to the economic performance of these FT processes. Of course, as, as is the case with most second generation biofuel production, uh, the capital cost is usually the largest con contributor in this. Uh, Technology, especially with the FT process. Uh, the field stock is relatively uh, high as well, uh, but depending on, on whether it's worse, it, if it's worse, it can be negative, for example, or it can be zero, at least at the moment. If it's woody biomass, then the, the field stock cost could be a significant contribution to the cost as well. Operation and maintenance, uh, anywhere between 15 to 30 percent, depending, of course, on the, on the field stock type. Probably the high end is for uh, waste field stocks since they require a certain pre treatment process that adds up to the overall cost. Other factor to consider is that uh, whether uh, the configuration is going to be integrated or standalone. Our experience in Sweden is that with integrated case, one can significantly contribute to improve the, the economic performance of uh, these processes. In general, in the FT process in particular. Uh, in a recent publication at uh, the International Energy Agency, Bioenergy Task 41, they have shown that the production costs via different uh, roads. And the first two are for uh, FT process from biomass and from waste. As you can see, uh, they assumed. Uh, uh, for example, for the West case, they assumed negative uh, fuel stock cost, so that, that's why the production cost is low. And for the high end of that West case, they assume the fuel stock or the West cost to be zero. On the other hand, uh, the biomass cost significantly contributes uh, to the production cost, as you can see here. Also, it's also important to distinguish between the different types of biomass. That's why we have a wide range for the high in and the low in case. But overall, it's between 75 to 145 euro per megawatt hour. And our literature review uh, for the high in and low in, which are shown here, I try to just scatter plot the the literature review or the case that we have uh, revised in this literature review. And as you can see, for most of the case, it fall in the range, but there are some outliers. That's be probably the economic assumption behind those, but also it could be due to uh, process configuration as well. As I mentioned, if it's integrated case, it significantly contributes in reducing uh, the overall production cost. For example, FT process generates quite significant amount of uh, medium pressure level steam if there is a process that can utilize that, for example, and as is the case of pulp mills where there is a need for a high steam demand that can be of value, then there is uh, such kind of synergies that should be considered as well. So for that reason, as you can see, the scatter plot, there is no any structure to follow here, but 
for most cases it falls in this range and it, uh, it, it kind of uh, uh, confirms that uh, the, these ranges are reasonable estimates uh, to start with. Sene, sorry to interrupt, but can you please come to a close? We're running yes. out of time. <laughs> this is my last slide, actually. And it's just a repetition of uh, uh, the case that I already stated that advanced biofilms are ex expected to contribute in the aviation and maritime primarily. Uh, there are a number of development happening right now in the FT arena and uh, one can expect, especially this is motivated by aviation fields, uh, but it's quite promising. And the wide range of economic production I just mentioned earlier is quite wide due to many assumptions that go behind these uh, numbers. And integrated configurations, of course, can help reduce the production cost in general. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Sene, for this presentation and summarizing uh, the content of the paper. Uh, there were a few questions in between in the chat. Um, uh, most of them relating to uh, the status of, of the various facilities. And um, I think, in fact, we, we have almost, um, there's only very few facilities really operational at the moment. Yes. And uh, you gave a very good reason for that, uh, that CapEx is really, really high, uh, as you could show. So, uh, for time reasons, I... Um, will not take any dedicated questions just for you at this moment, um, but I'd rather turn to the panel discussion. Uh, so I would invite uh, all the four speakers to turn on the cameras and the microphones again. Um, and we have um, up to 20 minutes to discuss a few points here. Um, thank you all for your interesting presentations. And I think um, um, yeah, there are some questions that um, probably uh, are good to address uh, for everyone in here. Um, the first one is, um, especially if we talk about fischer tropsch but also for the other um, technologies, would you rather go for co-processing in a refinery or would you rather um, say it would be better to upgrade so such bio crudes um, before you put them into the refinery or just blend into the final product. And I guess uh, the question goes to, to Senai, Silva and, and Stephen actually. Um, so whoever wants to go first. This is for Silva. Stephen, you worked in a refinery. You want to <laughs> yeah. start? Yeah, <laughs> I could, you know, we, we have been approached many times over the years about putting different things into the refinery. And uh, like I said in my, in my own presentation, the, the dilution of the carbon, that's one thing. So it depends on then how much you could get and how much you would put in. And then the, the refinery, you know, we, we talk about high capex, but refineries have a high capex. And so you, you're not going to take a risk. So you have to really have either long-term experiences from somebody else, somebody else has to take the first risk. You know, we, we've looked at, UOP has looked at fast pyrolysis into an FCC and how many of those are operating today. And um, so there's been, there's been lots of examples of what, what might occur, but um, from our experiences with re renewable diesel, when we were, you know, working, when I was working at Nest, they, we, we used dedicated units because then the customer can decide what level of blends they want to make. And um, so at least at the start, it seems that then ded dedicated units, maybe in, maybe once the technology is proven and the legislation is in place that you could just um, uh, get, get, get the benefit for that, from that renew renewable carbon, then co-processing would, would be the, probably the ultimate cheapest way to go, but at the start, probably dedicated units. I think it depends on the yeah, refinery. Every refinery will have a different a different approach. Also, depending on the products they want to do. So it's uh, as I said in the webinar, what we see in Europe, it's mostly people doing co-processing now. Of course, if your business is to produce renewable diesel, you want to have a standalone unit. <laughs> but if you have just to meet the blending obligation as a fuel supplier, I think many people will go for co-processing. If the if, if the feedstock is yeah if the feedstock is one of the easy feedstocks yes. Sylvain was looking at but yeah, yeah. 
I'm, I'm talking about advanced biofuels. Oh, yeah. yeah, here I would say you would need a uh, yeah, stabilization unit, say it, and here it would be standard 100%. And here you could co-process, I would say. But again, it has to be done very carefully. So as we often say, it depends. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> I think both, uh, both will, yes. they will be both. We will see all of it. And uh, with all type of feedstocks, all technologies, every approach would be used more or less, and it would depend on regional factors, I think, and the refiner, the history of the refinery sure, also. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Senna, do you want to add something here? No, I don't have anything to add. Specifically, no, okay. Just Good. one thing for Fisher Trope Works, I think, you know, how to cracker, this yeah. can be done, uh, it's done. So it's at least challenging. I think it's not that challenging if you have a how to cracker. I don't know, Stephen, what you think, but when, when we, we had the project and I was in charge of the Fisher Tropes and we were looking at upgrading of that Fisher Tropes waxes and there is a little bit of oxygen, so we have to be a little yeah. bit careful. There's a little bit of ac acidity there too. Yes. So e even though you're making, you know, these paraffins, it's not a hundred percent. So you have to be really careful. We, mm. we were th thinking about the different yeah, possibilities. And so there'd probably be a free hydro treater before you go into the refinery. Just it's done commercially in uh, yes, Sassol has been doing that for years. So it's yeah. done uh, you need yeah. with the right loading and unit, I think it can be done. Uh, it's low hanging sure. fruit, I think, for Fisher Drop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Uh so then um the, this question is probably more directed also to Monica with SICAPS technologies. Um, so, are you actually really targeting biofuels for transport, or um, is there different markets which offer uh, much higher revenues or better opportunities for your technology? And if if others feel like um, commenting afterwards, just go ahead. But let's have Monica have the first word here. Are you yeah, muted, I'm Monica? Good. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you if you just follow the the. Uh, the advanced biofuel now, I mean, we are selling forestry ethanol. I don't know how many that do that into low blending today. Uh, and, and you see how, how the, the T2 price is going for, for advanced ethanol. Uh, you can imagine that we need to regulate. It will become something in, in, in a short time. But uh, being a chemical producer and also for biofuels, of course, we would like to continue as I mentioned, I mean, if, if you have a rotation of, say, forestry sector in, in Sweden for, for spruce and pine of 70 years or something like that for this, and, and, and then, I mean, then I, I can a little bit, I want to argue that we need maybe to differentiate different biomass fractions in, in, in different regions in the world, and, and what, can, what will be in this chemical platform, what will be, will it be this nice sawdust, uh, or, or should we aim that type of uh, clean fractions into? I mean, this is something that we need to to discuss. In that it will be maybe by done by regulation, or it will be in in uh, you know rotation time. And 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 so I think it's yes. Uh, the biofuels is something that we will sell today. We will sell uh, if we if we create this uh, product in Sweden, we will sell it most likely to uh, where we get the most profit. And if it then is regulated to premium based uh, low blending ethanol, yes, but we would like to have it uh, to support the transition into the green bulk chemical sector. But the pricing are not there. We need yes. to value, yeah. Over, over the years, we looked, um, it, it seems that the chemicals area should be the higher value and you should get a higher price. And that's normally the case. But when you have, um, legislation on advanced biofuels, then it, 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 it increases the, the sort of the market price for those. So it, it doesn't seem to make logical sense that you would go for the fuels opposed to the chemicals, but as, as it was said, that you have the mandates and you don't have the mandates on the chemistry side, so it's a customer's selection. And can he pass that extra cost onto, the, onto his customers? Yeah. So that is, I mean, we, we see that trend now actually increasing. So we see like, you know, companies like, you know, IKEA or other big, I mean, what, what are, or, or for example, when you go to yourself, I mean, what cannot be replaced by electrical uh, transition? And, and, and I mean, everything from shampoo to other things and that we want to have. 
in our mm -hmm. daily basis. I mean, what, and, and we are producing chemicals today, at least that is very high up in the value chain so that needs to be further processed by, by chemical companies. And we also been we're discussing bio nafta for our hydrolysate lignin. I think that could be an interesting route to see that if we can fit that in, it's not there today. It's not maybe I think it exists some demonstration, but not enough demonstration. And, and you discussed earlier about oxygen. I think that we that could be an interesting route to to higher value of the lignin that will be uh, derived if you do this processing with this biothermal conversion platform uh, to work together with with companies that have that infrastructure already. Um, yeah, quickly. Uh, of course, for fuels, but we see the chemical industry to wake up, mostly a uh, pet chem industry. So I have two examples top of my head. So the renewable nafta you produce when you had a process uh, renewable feedstocks, it's a big demand now for all the pet chem and uh, industries. They send it to steam cracker, they make ethylene, propylene, mm -hmm. and then they can make poly uh, P, PP. And then the other projects we started working five, six years ago was upgrading of plastic pyrolysis oil. And here it is the first project we're all about making uh, transport fuels. Quickly it moved to make, uh, uh, yeah, feed for steam cracker. Mm -hmm. And here we have a lot of projects on this. So, but again, it's interesting because it's not driven by legislation. Like Monica said, it's more like the yeah pull from the market. People always green thing and uh, Coca Cola, Unilever, mm -hmm. Ikea, you name it, Lego. They want some uh, mm -hmm. renewable, uh, yeah, feedstocks. And this is an interesting point that you mentioned here, uh, because we often have the, the impression that the consumer does not make a lot of a difference, but obviously through um, demanding from the companies, um, there is also demand for green products and green chem chemicals um, and green transport services, uh, which also helps the biofuels case then again. Good. Um, so we have a, an interesting question from the audience here uh, because we have a set of different technologies that were presented. Um, but if we really go for fuels, especially for um, aviation sector, shipping sector, um, uh, this is really um, high demand of specific fuels. And um, how, how, what do you see? How can these technologies fulfill big demands? Anyone who likes to go first. Steven. <laughs> I'm throwing you under the bus. And oh, then I, I, everybody's looked from the feedstock side and amount of residues. And when it, when I started in this renewable energy game, I was looking at also energy crops, and there's been a lot of study on energy crops. And and then in in addition to those, we have the biogenic portion of MSW. So my understanding is, yes, as we electrify transport, the demand for fossil becomes less, and then we can really increase the, the percentage of this renewable carbon in, in the liquid liquid fuels. And so what is the potential? I guess you, you have the technical pen, potential, then you have the economic potential, and um, it's really hard to say how quickly these technologies can roll out, because as Monica showed, it's taken a long time for SECUB to come this far. And some of the other technologies we're looking at are sort of much, much further back. So it's, I, I believe, I, I believe we can get high percentages of renewable carbon in the marine sector and the aviation sector and in the heavy transport sector. But the question is then the, the timing and the cost. So who knows? I think for, okay, if we take SAF, so you have, you know, we all know we have seven pathways that are approved now and two for core processing. So one ha solution now, and actually there's a really nice report from the World Economic Forum from last year, where they list all the feedstocks, all the pathway and how much they expect. I think it's clean, clean sky for tomorrow, something like that. Mm -hmm. So here I would say, uh, yeah, virgin oil, western and fats, it's right now it's available. Long term, like when, uh, which, yeah, with the password approved, I think gasification of municipal solid waste has a part to play and gasification, alcohol to jet. Mm -hmm. If the pyrolysis and uh, HTL are approved, then you can also use it. 
for marine, I think the specs are much more. I was when I talked to uh, shipping industry, they say if you can shovel it, we can use it. Yes. So basically, yeah. any specs is negotiable except viscosity, flash point for safety reasons. So I think mm -hmm. it's much more flexible. And here, that would be, uh, I think, the thermo like pyrolysis and HTL have a big part to play if technology is proven at large scale for marine. Of course, also all the methanol and ammonia talk, but if you think and uh, like ships, what is the lifetime of a ship? 25 years. Mm -hmm. So if ships that are built now, they need to run on something. You cannot have an <laughs> engine and all of them. So we need, I think, and here this technology will have a, a part to play. So all technologies, there's no silver bullet, as people often say. So all technology will have a part to play. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just comment on that? Uh, and also th that was one idea for us also. You, I mean, we, we need some moisture in our feedstock for our technology processing using hydrolysis. So in a way, uh, processing really dry materials, say if you talk about, you know, forest residue that is really dry, be left out uh, for years, uh, that, that maybe you need another conversion uh, technology that can handle really dry materials. So that's why the, the product we are aiming with is that we can a little bit be more flexible on the feedstock side. So we can use this more solvolysis uh, into crude lignin oil instead uh, for that kind of, of feedstock and then take the moist feedstock, the sawdust, directly into our pretreatment. So we more create a more flexible pretreatment. Okay, thank you for that. So very interesting considerations, but we have to round up the session. So I'm going to pose one question um, the, for that everybody should please consider in the light of your own presentation today and the technology you've presented. So um, we, we have seen that they are at different technology readiness levels um, and they're also obviously using um, the range of feedstocks. Um, but and do you see some research needs very specifically for your uh, the technology that you've been uh, talking about today? So can you just highlight one or two um, research needs that need to be addressed? And uh, Monica, okay. maybe you yeah. can start because yeah. you had a very yeah, specific, ahead. I mean, you have that Cellu apps technology yeah. and it's very easy to know which technology yeah. you yeah. should consider yeah. here. So, so I can say that we, as, as <laughs> you, you, someone said earlier that, I mean, SECAP has been developing and to be honest, we have developed, we had first two stage hydrolysis acid, now we have this frag. So it's been a, a journey, to, so to say, and now we are here to be able to put up the guarantees that our client need. We partnered with trash industries uh, to be able to, to go commercial, to have the optimization that the partner that already can put up this plant and also have the experience for first generation bioethanol. So I think that we are ready and we are also with three Nordic products already up, go, up and running. So I really hope that we will see this commercialization with this platform and there are already products. I mean, so we can talk about more or less if it's Seca, but if it's some other players, this platform will have, a, a, I mean, create value together with other technologies that we heard today. I think that we need to have a, a variation and also depending on where you are in the world. So yes, I don't see that we need more research now, but as being a researcher, then I always are very curious. So of course, downstream, we would like to, to, we are still in development phase for the lignin. We still need to get paid uh, for the lignin. Being a product owner, I, ne I need to get a lot of money for the lignin, to be honest, and, and trying to push that. So downstream uh, valorization of lignin, we have not seen the end of that. Uh, and also maybe for, for some other, you know, tailored uh, product routes, of course we need more research, but not for this, to scale up for wood to ethanol. That is already, can go go on now, so I can't see it. Thank you, Monica. Um, Stephen, you were already like <laughs> taking yeah. breath to <laughs> reply. I'm a I'm a researcher. I love research, but from the HDL side, you have to build the demonstration plants to know what the bottlenecks are, to know what has to be improved, to know where the research has to go. They've done labs and pilots for 15 years now. Now they have to go forward like the silver green fuels building the big demonstration plant and then seeing where the research should be focused because 
I, we could, we could, in, in the refinery, we still do research, but research never stops. But, you know, that the focus should be on the demonstration projects on the HTL and then feeding that information back into looking at what research needs are. I agree with Stephen. It's really about upscaling. I think we're ready to upgrade more or less, give or take, to upgrade these feedstocks. It's really about the upscaling and then also how to integrate. It's a new supply chain that needs to be made in place. So ways of solid waste. You have sawdust, where does a plant needs to be and trans but it's not research as such. So but it's I think this is where the button not the bottleneck, but the next thing to unfold to solve is this, and then research will come as such. But I think the the bulk of the research is done. Stephen, I don't know if you agree. I think we're not that far, maybe 80% is done, and then there will always be things we can learn. But mm -hmm. yeah, as I mentioned, I think stabilization for things that we need to solve now is stabilization of feedstocks and understand how the feed affects the quality of the bio crude. Uh, pre treatment, I think pre treatment companies have to do some work on uh, how to remove contaminants for these feedstocks. Yeah. And, and uh, is, yeah. is, is this research or is this testing of different? Yeah, so you could call it research, but it depends on what, what you want to define as research. I call it sort of testing of equipment and looking at different solutions. So, okay. Yeah. Well. Good, thank you. And uh, finally, Senai for Fisher Trap specifically. Yep. I, I don't think there is a need for uh, further research in Fisher Trops actually. It has been, Fisher Trops has been known for over a hundred years now. Technology is quite developed. And uh, the gasification process from biomass to the singles that can be fed to the FT process has been demonstrated for different types of configurations. For example, in Sweden, black liquor gasification has been demonstrated, and in also solid biomass in Gothenburg, the same happened in Austria and in other parts of the world as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, about uh, getting the first of its kind plant installations and as of course as uh, the other panelists say that then learn from that if there is a need for further optimization or uh, yeah process development further requirements thank you thanks a lot so that's a nice summary everybody's saying yeah we will not stop researching specific issues but actually we want to scale up we want to demonstrate we want to be commercial and we want to learn from these um, demonstrations and the first commercial plants. Exactly. Yeah, so with this, we've come to an end of our session. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you a lot to the speakers for the very interesting presentations and um, panel discussion. Uh, all presentations and the recording will be made available. I believe we have um, email addresses of all the speakers in their presentations. So all everyone who has a specific question, I'm sure, is um, um, welcome to send an email to you directly. And uh, with this, I'd like to close the session of today and invite you all to join tomorrow. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, I hope to see you tomorrow when we continue with more interesting subjects. So great presentations and very much appreciated. Have a good uh, afternoon, everyone, and a nice lunch. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks.